gentlemen or men, we call that an enemy to the uh, jazz study we do here. Welcome and right to yours. Perfect. Okay, thank you very much for the invitation to visit. It's been really great to um, talk with everyone. And so today, I think this somehow doesn't show up on here, but that'll be okay. Um, so today I'm going to be telling you about some work that I've been doing for the last kind of number of years with a couple or a variety of different people now on trying to use some techniques from more formal theory to try and understand real world uh, collisions and real world QCD. Um, and so these techniques were originally kind of developed to understand a particular limit of QCD, which is the conformal limit where you have no scales. And so the original interest in the formal community was in studying so-called conformal field theory. And so this is something which is very distinct from, let's say, like nuclear physics, which is of the interest of many people here. But one of the kind of surprises which came out of this is that this way of talking about jets is actually very useful for identifying scales um, in field theory. And so this is something which in QCD, there's a large number of uh, intrinsic and emergent scales. And so there's been a kind of focus in trying to use these observables, which are originally introduced in these kind of idealized conformal field theory settings where you have no scales to actually understand um, scales in QCD. Um, and so I'll try and give a kind of very general overview of this program today. So I'm not gonna go too much into the details on either the technical side or the kind of application side to just kind of give a broad overview of the uses of this um, kind of way of thinking for um, jet physics. Okay, and so just as a warm up, although everyone here is obviously very familiar with this. So when you collide, let's say protons at the LHC, you get all these beautiful um, kind of jets, so these very impressive um, cones of hadrons. And so the kind of most naive thing you can do or the simplest way of analyzing these very complicated uh, collisions is to kind of project them into some cones which have some total energy and some uh, direction. And you can do this in an IRC safe way. And so the kind of motivation for thinking about these things in this way is one, it's the kind of simplest from a data analysis perspective but also what you're trying to access is kind of the underlying um, hard scattering, let's say matrix element of the collision. So if you're measuring the kind of angles and energies of these jets, your ultimate interest is in the kind of underlying hard scattering, for example, of six gluons. And so this is the kind of simplest thing which you can do at a collider, but already this kind of drove a huge amount of um, progress in kind of really theory, theory development in quantum field theory. So, the desire to understand these very complicated collisions really motivated a lot of um, very nice developments in quantum field theory. And on the phenomenological side, this enabled kind of very precise tests of QCD. So for example, you can measure all these different cross sections with many, many jets, and you're probing the kind of underlying um, matrix elements of these collisions. And on the kind of, let's say beyond the standard model side, you can use these to search for um, kind of new physics. And so this has been a kind of very successful program both driving new ideas in quantum field theory and having kind of very practical uh, spin-offs at Collider. I think we have some questions. And yeah. Just because not everybody is a jet expert. Um, yeah. On the previous slide, you said IRC safe. I understand IR safe, but what's IR safe? We'll just go with IR safe. Yeah. Cool. Yeah, perfect. It's just a slightly different, it's the same underlying meaning. Yes. Uh, thanks. And feel free to interrupt with any questions if, yeah, if anything I say is unclear. Um, Berkeley hasn't changed. Yes. <laughs> Um, okay, and so this has been a kind of uh, a great success. Um, but if you go back to this kind of picture, which I showed before, of course, this kind of angular distributions and energies of these cones is in some sense the most kind of simple question you can ask about these collider events. And so both just from a pure data analysis perspective, um, as well as from a kind of quantum field theory or field theory perspective, there's many other questions which you would like to be able to understand. And so one very simple set of questions is if you have one individual jet, instead of viewing it just as coming out at some angle, you'd like to ask about the kind of statistical distribution of the radiation inside the jet. So that's kind of illustrated here in this little picture of this um, thing measuring this three point correlation function. And so once you really think about this kind of in analogy with the cosmic microwave background, that your detector is kind of sitting out um, at infinity and you get all this kind of energy flux um, deposited into your um, collider. And so you'd like to be able to kind of decode this to understand how these correlations arise from the underlying um, physics. And so the original motivation for this was kind of a very um, practical minded um, thing coming from the LHC, namely that if you are able to um, measure, for example, higher point correlation functions, 
and detect or use them to detect um, kind of different things going on in your collisions, then this really allows you uh, a whole bunch of new ways, in particular qualitatively new ways, of studying physics at the LHC. So you could imagine, for instance, that you produce some new particle. So here's just um, some Z prime. It doesn't matter exactly what it is. But the point is that this just decays into some hadrons into your detector. And so if you're this experimentalist out in infinity and you're just measuring these kind of patterns on your detector, there's no way just from measuring, for example, the angles or the kind of energies of these jets that you see anything. And so the only way that this object imprints its existence into the um, detectors in infinity is through kind of subtle correlations in the patterns of energy flux. And so what you'd like to be able to do is to design observables or to understand things well enough so that you can understand that there's some kind of new particle which was hidden inside. And so this kind of really reinvigorated the study of kind of jets in QCD, and it's been an extremely um, powerful technique at the LHC. And so I won't go through um, any of the actual applications, but this is just one particular plot showing that it's something that is actually um, used at the LHC. And so this is um, something that is particularly of interest to the high energy uh, physics community. But for many people, let's say in nuclear physics, there's probably far more interesting questions than looking for a Z prime. And so in particular, imprinted in this kind of energy flux and in infinity, you have some presumably answers to, let's say, how confinement uh, behaves, what is the nature of the quark gluon plasma. And in some sense, it's very similar, um, at least in spirit, to what is trying to be done in jet substructure. But instead of trying to find some kind of underlying particle, you really want to use this asymptotic flux of energy and infinity to kind of decode it to understand features of, let's say, the mechanism of confinement or detailed uh, properties of the quark gluon plasma. And so some of these techniques have started being kind of moving over from high energy physics to actually trying to ask even more detailed questions to really be able to learn about the kind of underlying mechanisms um, in QCD, which produce this radiation at infinity. And so how should one kind of try and think about decoding um, these correlations? And so I said kind of a nice analogy to have in mind is the cosmic microwave background or also um, condensed matter systems. So in many other areas of physics, one way of trying to kind of decode what's going on is to use correlation functions. And so these kind of um, characterize uh, your particular system. And so again, in this um, cosmology, cosmological case, you've probably seen these plots of, for example, these two point functions on the CMB, where what they're telling you is kind of how, um, or different physical scales, or where different physical scales are kind of imprinted in the CMB. And so as you change the kind of angular or distance scale, you're sensitive to um, different physics. And so you can then go further and start to measure, for example, higher point correlation functions, which tell you more detailed properties of the interactions of the underlying system. So for example, in cosmology, you often measure, for example, a three point correlation function, which is some form of non-Gaussianity, which is telling you some detailed property of how the underlying particles kind of interacted as they're going into the CMB. And so what we or I would like is a kind of similarly coherent picture of collider physics, where you can really measure kind of correlation functions of the asymptotic energy flux and back out questions about the underlying kind of particles, either beyond the standard model particles, um, intrinsic mass scales like the top quark mass or the B quark mass, but also kind of emergent scales like um, the confinement scale or scales in the quark gluon plasma. Um, and so the reason why this had some connection with uh, more formal um, field theory is that there was this very nice kind of insight, which was, um, it was it kind of floating around in the literature before, but was really popularized by um, Hoffman and Maldacena uh, here, which they kind of abstracted this question of if you're just in some idealized, so conformal field theory is just a field theory with no scales, which theorists like to play with. And so if you were in such a theory and you just wanted to ask questions of, from a very abstract perspective in some ideal theory, how you decode these kind of correlations in the energy flux. And so they had this very nice um, insight that what you're doing is not measuring kind of correlation functions of standard operators, but instead you're measuring correlation functions of calorimeter cells, which is of course what experimentalists um, know, but that one can actually write down a kind of field theory definition of what is a calorimeter cell. And so instead of taking just, let's say um, a stress tensor, you can take the stress tensor of your field theory and you can dot it into some particular direction, which means you're trying to measure the energy flux in that particular direction. Then you integrate over all time, which is kind of like you're just having your detector set on infinity as a bunch of stuff uh, comes through it. 
and you move it off to infinity. And so that's just saying that from the perspective of QCD or something, your detector is way um, far away. And so you can really think about this object as um, a physical kind of calorimeter cell. So it's essentially like the quantum field theory version of a calorimeter cell. And so in this talk, I'll either draw them kind of like this. And so this is how you should think about them if this is the actual detector as really a point localized in some particular direction. But if you look at these, or if you're more a fan of looking at the kind of global structure in these kind of 10 rows diagrams, then it's illustrated as these lines because you're kind of integrating over all time at asymptotic null infinity as the kind of radiation slowly goes through your detector. Do you have a question? Yeah. Actually, it's on a previous, previous slide, which I've been mulling over. Yeah. Non-Gaussianity. Can yeah. you define that and how they use it in cosmology? Good. So I'll, I'll come back to the, I'll do this more precisely in QCD. But so one way to think about it is, if you, let's say you measured a three-point correlation function, it will, or like a higher point correlation function. If it's non-Gaussian, it means that that higher point correlation function is not completely characterized by the two-point function. So you should think about it like if I have like a Gaussian distribution, it's characterized just by like the, the um, standard deviation. And so if I have a three-point, I'll have like disconnected components, which are just like products of two-point functions. And so the non-Gaussianity is like the three-point function divided by the products of the two-point function. And so this would be exactly unity if there's no like non-trivial interactions um, between the particles. But if you have actual interactions, then it will be non-unit, not unity. In other contexts, one uses cumulus to, uh, yeah, so to, it's isolate, a, to isolate high order. It's order. a very similar, it's just kind of a different language, but it's, it's the same, it's, it's, exactly a, the same. it's, it's essentially, you're just trying to isolate the, um, it's how one kind of likes in, in this language to talk about it, but it's doing the same thing that isolating there's no, there's higher no underlying assumption of the limit theorem. No, 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 no. Yeah. And here, like one has to def like these non-Gaussianity is kind of used loosely. And so like when we do it, we'll have our particular definition for these energy fluxes, but it's kind of it's always some like essentially three-point function divided by products of lower things, um, which is designed to be one in some limit and is trying to probe some interactions about those limits. Yeah. So that's a very good question. Okay, um, and so the nice thing about this kind of definition is it kind of allows us to kind of phrase what is jet substructure from a kind of formal field theoretic perspective. Namely, you could just say to your formal field theory friend that jet substructure is the study of these kind of higher point correlation functions of these energy flow operators in some non-trivial state. And so that state could be a state of the LHC, some state of the core Coulomb plasma or something like that. Um, and we'll do different states uh, throughout this um, talk. And so this is very nice because you can start to use more formal field theory techniques to try and understand these complicated objects. Um, and that's kind of what we'll do uh, throughout the talk. And so just to kind of reinforce this point a little bit, because these objects are a little um, maybe unfamiliar to people. So people will definitely be familiar with um, amplitudes on this side. And so the reason why people like amplitudes in um, high energy physics or in collider experiments is because they have these asymptotic states which go out to infinity. And so the problem with that is that these are not IR finite. So here I dropped the C, uh, sorry for the slow up earlier. So these are not IR finite. And so that means you have to, so this underlying scattering of gluons is kind of a very nice theoretical object, but you then have to put in these cones in the experiment, which makes things a little bit um, more difficult to understand theoretically. On the other hand, people in like condensed matter like to study correlation functions of local operators. So you just have your kind of four correlators on your table and you do whatever you want to do with them. And so these are nice because these are perfectly well-defined um, theoretically. So that they're, they're IR finite, um, but they don't have asymptotic states. So they're not what you can actually do in a collider experiment. And so these energy correlators are kind of the best of both worlds. And you should think of them as kind of a combination of a correlation function and an amplitude i.e. they're essentially taking correlation functions and moving them off to um, infinity. And so they're exactly what you want in an actual um, collider experiment. But aren't you still stuck with the cones? Because if you do these inside a jet, you have to first define a jet. That's a very good question. So in an ideal world, um, you could do it without the cones. So, so if you, in like a purely, from a purely theoretical perspective, you could do it without a cone. And so from a, experimental perspective, it's much nicer to first use essentially the cone to trigger, but then the way we'll use them is to, we'll always be assuming that the correlators are kind of small or their angle is small compared to the cone. So that the cone is really being used as an auxiliary um, kind of thing to identify high energy jets 
um, from the perspective of D. Um, so there's in like an ideal, let's say you could just do E plus E minus colliders. Then you could really just never talk about cones and just measure correlation functions. And they would really have this kind of mapping to the CMB. Because of the LHC or Hadron colliders in general are more complicated, it's nice to be able to kind of trigger on things. Uh, but from the perspective that I'm pushing is that the jets are kind of an auxiliary and these are the, the primary, but one can- but When you show some results- They're always inside um, jets. And so I, I am taking advantage of the fact that one can cluster in some high energy jet and use that to trigger and then measure these inside jets. Yeah, yeah, no, it's, it's, that's a very good question. Um, and people can push either, I think there's some kind of middle ground where both are kind of useful depending on the particular questions. It just might um, mean that the comparison to what you guys can calculate from field theory has some uh, it, ranges where- it, it Exactly, work. absolutely, absolutely. And in particular, so what I'll discuss here is mostly an expansion about the small angle limit. And this is the limit where one can have kind of universal behavior that will agree between like what we compute and the kind of experimental realities. If you want to look at these at like generic angles, that's when it's very sensitive to how exactly you're doing it. Um, yes. Yeah. Are there other kinds of uh, correlations of statistical nature, like one jettiness? Is there? Can I going to talk about this? The connection between this and those other sorts of observables? Yeah. So, so something like one jettiness, I would say, is not a strict correlator, and so because it's so, it can be expanded over these correlation functions. But if you try and expand it, you actually need an infinite number of these correlation functions. And so these objects are in some sense simpler than like one genus. Um, and they're like a strict correlation function. And so that's what actually makes them much easier to compute and to understand. And so part of the thing that or we're trying to kind of push is to talk about things purely in terms of these correlation functions and less in terms of those. And I'll come back to this in a second, less in terms of like jet shape observables. Uh, because one genus is kind of constraining the shape of a jet. And so if I have one jet, I get kind of one number. Whereas here, if I have one jet, I get all these kind of pairs of correlations, which I ensemble over. And so I can no, I can no longer associate like a jet to a number, or I can't say like a jet has some shape measure. And so it's a slightly different phrase in the question, which makes it, I think, easier to interpret. Um, well, and when jet is on one jet is not very useful. You want, it to, you want a distribution over population. But yes, yes. but. But what, but the question, but you're, the way you're doing that distribution, it, it's like a, you can either have like for each jet. So for these observables, for each jet, you get a distribution and then you ensemble average over distributions. Whereas for one jettiness for each jet, you get a number and then you measure many of those numbers to get a distribution. So it's kind of like two ways of getting a final smooth distribution. And our claim is that from the theory perspective, this way is much easier to talk about than the like n jettiness way. Um, yes. Um, so these kind of things live in this kind of uh, middle regime, but despite their physical importance, i.e. their actual kind of physical things that you can measure in experiments, um, they're much less explored, but this is something which is kind of starting to change on the theory side. So there's been a huge amount of interest in understanding these energy correlators just from a, a formal um, field theory perspective. Um, and so what I'm going to talk about in this talk is some of this recent um, progress in understanding these energy flow, which are also referred to sometimes as light ray operators, and to show how these really allow the calculation um, and measurement of kind of shapes and scaling of multipoint correlators. So I'll show that we can actually measure these um, at the LHC, and then try and discuss how these can be applied to a wide range of different problems for understanding kind of intrinsic and emergent scales from this asymptotic energy flux. So to really show how we can kind of measure these um, correlation functions in this asymptotic energy flux and extract out kind of a bunch of interesting questions about the underlying dynamics. Um, and so I'll try and break the talk up into kind of two pieces. So the first part of the talk, I'm gonna focus more on this relation to kind of um, behavior of QCD when it's nearly conformal. And so this is this regime where these observables were originally kind of introduced to understand. And so this is a nice mapping to the scaling behavior kind of very high energy quarks and gluons. And so in this regime, what I kind of want to show is that these observables essentially give rise to featureless um, kind of scaling uh, laws, which are very similar to let's say critical phenomena. So there you ha essentially have no scales. And so you just get these very nice power laws from which you can extract some kind of exponents, which determine the behavior of quarks and gluons. And then in the second part of the talk, I wanna start kind of adding in different scales to show how these kind of modify the behavior of these observables. 
And so the kind of nice feature of these observables is if you have originally something which has a very nice um, scaling behavior, then when you put in some scale, it kind of imprints itself in very um, uh, strong ways. And so for example, I'll discuss kind of how hadronization leads to a very abrupt change in the scaling behavior or how we can use these to kind of image the size of like nuclei or of the quark gluon plasma or of uh, quark masses. And so the kind of two or a very kind of sharp um, line between these two parts of the talk one where essentially you have no scales and I'm just looking at kind of smooth power laws and then start adding in all these different kind of scales that we have in QCD and so they all kind of imprint themselves in these correlators in a variety of different ways. Yeah. So, but the first, the conformal will make this very existent, right? It just means that yeah. the higher mass force. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So they're both, they're both completely physical. Um, and it's in some sense, this is kind of more the background that I come from, from very high energy jets. And this was the, my original motivation in starting to study these was to see these nice um, scaling behaviors. And so these give us certain anomalous dimensions of the underlying quarks and gluons. And so they're completely physical and extremely interesting. Uh, and then the kind of surprise, at least to me, was that these turn out to also be a very nice way to think about when you have other scales or when you have sizes in the problem. And so it's kind of splits. They're both yeah, equally physical and depends on maybe your background of which one you like more than um, the other. Yeah. Yeah. So, so you, the, for the uh, kind of the experiment question, do you have to record every particle of, or I mean, it's like your example, in you plus and minus. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, you plus and minus collider, you have perfect. Uh, yeah, yeah. So, do you need a perfect detector to, no. to to get every, every particle? Or you no. So, to, so for you can do it just the particles like inside a jet. And then you can further like restrict to like the charged particles or something. So we, we know how to add in that into the calculation. So part of what we have is like, and part of what we developed, which kind of moved it from these original kind of conformal collider papers where they were assuming that you have a kind of perfect detector is so we kind of combine that with like factorization theorems describing the production of the jet and the actual like clustering and how to do this in these more um, realistic cases. Um, and so we can actually do like this calculation that's compared with here is like the actual calculation when it's inside a jet with all the actual experimental um, pieces put in. And so that can um, be done. And because this kind of small angle limit is universal, it doesn't actually end up changing the behavior very much. Um, okay. um, yeah, yeah. You basically can assume this can happen in any place. So <laughs> you can one place and exactly, exactly. Because you have like you can control the angle between them, and so like if you go to like the back-to-back -back limit or something, this is very non-universal, and you need you probe like the transverse momentum-dependent PDFs and the like initial state. But if you move them towards each other, it's more like it's almost like a fragmentation factorization, like an inclusive factorization, mm -hmm. and then you can you're essentially insensitive up to some quark gluon fraction about all the initial dynamics. And so you really get this essentially an exact mapping to the universal scaling behavior that's predicted in like a, a idealized world. And so in this limit, you essentially come back to your idealized world. Yeah. Okay, so the first part of this talk will be on the kind of scaling behavior of quarks and gluons. Um, and so the first part that one should answer is kind of why from a, at least, and this will be the more kind of HEP um, TH phrasing of this question, is why is jet substructure theoretically interesting? And so of course you can measure these correlators for kind of generic angles, but the reason why this small angle limit is particularly interesting is related to this um, question, that in this limit you expect some universal behavior as these operators are brought together. And the kind of very nice analogy that one should have in mind is this operator project expansion um, shown over here, which controls, uh, for example, critical uh, behavior. And so the nice thing about this, for, from my perspective, is you have some kind of very messy or big um, experiment and you can measure, for example, some heat capacity or some properties of this. And these exhibit very nice scaling behaviors which are exactly associated to parameters of the underlying field theory. So you can make some kind of macroscopic measurement and directly map it to some very precise quantity in the underlying field theory. And so what we would like for um, the LHC is you have some similarly very complicated collisions and you would like to make some measurement on the asymptotic energy flux and really identify a kind of scaling where you know exactly what you're measuring from this um, asymptotic energy flux. And so the very nice thing is that these energy flow operators actually emit an operator product expansion. 
And so the way I want you to think about this is if I have two of these energy um, detectors, as I bring them together, they'll have some scaling behavior in the um, angle between the two detectors. And so this is kind of like an operator project expansion for um, detector cells. And so of course the quote unquote detectors that one gets on the right hand side of this equation are not physical detectors. You cannot kind of build them, but there's something that one has in um, kind of theory world. And so what they are is kind of detectors which detect some more general state other than just um, energy flux. And so the exact form of this formula doesn't really matter. The important thing is just that it predicts the scaling behavior as these two operators are um, moved together and apart um, in terms of some parameters of the underlying theory. So one knows exactly if you measure, for example, 2.4 liter, you know exactly what you're measuring on this side. And so if you have this, then it really allows kind of a very different way of approaching jet substructure. So instead of kind of computing kind of splittings as the jet evolves, you can just talk about detector cells and this operator product expansion. And then if you have some like, let's say three point correlation function, you can just kind of iteratively um, apply this uh, formula and really understand just using the symmetry properties and this so-called operator product expansion, um, you can understand um, the answer. And so this is how things are or traditionally done for local operators in like a conformal field theory. And so here, one is trying to kind of mimic um, that approach but in terms of these um, detector cells. Quick question yeah. on the formula there, what yeah. is it tau i? So tau i, we'll come back to it, but it's just a known, so it's just a, a known number. So it's in the same as here, you just have some, in this case, it's called an anomalous dimension. So it's just that for this particular operator, it will have some anomalous dimension associated with it, which you can compute. And so in this case, this tau i is called the twist. And so it will depend on the particular operator, which is given um, here. And so I'll show what it exactly is in QCD in a second, mm -hmm. but it's just a number that you can compute. And so if you know what this OI is, then it tells you what the scaling behavior is. So you would calculate the splits would, and from that you would get- Exactly, exactly, exactly. And so the, the nice thing, and I'll show as you measure different correlation functions, you know which OI appear on the right-hand side. And so you can exactly say like, if I measure this, I probe this particular tau i. Um, and so then these are things which are like known in QCD and they kind of characterize essentially the splittings in QCD. They're a particular set of, you should think of this just like critical exponents um, for statistical mechanics. So these are just some particular properties of QCD. And I'll show it for QCD, I'll show exactly what they are in a second. Um, okay. And so this is in some sense, the like most simple thing you could probably possibly ask about a jet. And so one thing one should ask is why this hasn't been kind of done before. And so this is actually introduced around 2008. And there's this kind of nice exchange, or at least is an exchange that supports the point I'm trying to make between uh, Polchinski, David Gross over there and um, Maldacena. And so Polchinski or Maldacena kind of presented this and said, like, if you go to the LHC and do, for example, this, you should see this very nice um, scaling behavior. And so Polchinski, I think rightfully said, you have a huge amount of QCD data, like how come this hasn't been done uh, before? Or why can't you just go to see the scaling? And so his answer is kind of people don't do this. I don't know why they don't. I think they haven't just thought about this. Um, well, maybe they didn't, maybe none of us did it because we said, ha, ah, but the world didn't conform. Yes, and so I think this is, um, part of this is a communication issue between the very formal theorists and the um, experimentalists. And so, but this is a, an actual transcript of an exchange. I don't think it's representative, yes. And I suggest, actually, this is on the web. You can hear them. Too. Yeah, yeah. I suggest a different response to Maldacena. So um, when we think about jets and you know jet quenching, for instance, yeah, yeah. jet propagating through the plasma, <clears throat> the, the mental picture I start with, and I'm pretty sure it goes for everybody, is a color charge that's kind of out of, out of equilibrium and flying through a medium. Yeah. What happens? It gets deflected and raises. Yeah. That's a color charge. Yeah. <clears throat> it's a distinct object. And eventually, or also in vacuum, you know, the jet is, we're trying to reconstruct, you know, a quark jet or a muon jet yeah. associated with a, at least in QCD, a physical object. I find these things, I, mean, I hear what you're saying, and I have you know, yeah. no objections, yeah. but they're more abstract. I, I can't oh. associate them with a physical object. So I think that is, you could call it psychological, or maybe there's kind of physical intuition why people want to reconstruct jets as jets and and correlate them as kind of yeah. parts of gluons, yeah. um, as opposed to these more abstract uh, correlations. 100% agree. 
And so, and I think the, the much better, that, that is a much better response. And I think in particular, part of the reason is exactly as you said, that the original goal of a lot of these um, jet observables was to exactly use them as proxies for the underlying quarks and gluons. And so if you want to do, for example, probe the spin structure of the gluon, you want to measure the kind of, you want to associate jets with the underlying proxies and measure their angular distribution. And so for those, I think these jet, and that's why these kind of jet shapes were um, originally introduced and took preference over these energy correlators. And for that purpose, I 100% agree. And so what I hope to convince you in the second part of the talk is that by, is that some of these questions, more subtle questions about the energy flux are actually easier to probe in terms of these correlators. That for these types of questions, you want to associate things with um, jets, but there's other questions where things imprint very nicely into this energy flux, which make them both, they're certainly easier to calculate, but also I think they have some intuitive properties. So that I will, um, but that, I agree that is the better um, answer to the question. Uh, that I completely agree. Uh, but twist is, but, high, but knowing what twist is very physical and helpful as long as you know what process, process I, you're talking about. I agree, I agree. And I think part of this is that like, Mal, the way Malacena thinks about this is very different than the way you think about it. <laughs> um, but I think there's some- and We are um, in agreement. Yeah. <laughs> there is some, half, I think there are things from both sides, which are, I think it's the common- more, <laughs> Yeah, well, you both have a lot of citations, but the, um, not by a lot. I, uh, <laughs> I have done good papers. Yeah, the, the, I think it's the combination of both that is is um, most powerful. Um, um, sure, they they coexist. I guess. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, and so, I mean, what one can kind of now that one has these very nice um, jets at all these experiments, one can really go out and actually measure these scaling behaviors um, inside jets. Check the time. I'm not doing so right the time, but okay. So now we want to make more precise what this actual um, tau i is. And so in conformal field theories, this is a kind of um, very nice and well understood um, expansion where you really can determine exactly what all these tau i's are and kind of resum this full series in this kind of exact expansion. And so the reason why it's very useful for jet substructure is the same reason why this operator product expansion is very useful for critical phenomena, namely in the small angle limit, you only need the kind of um, lowest twist operator. So you only need essentially the first term in the Taylor expansion. So you just think of it as Taylor expansion and you only need the kind of leading term. And so these objects are called twist two light rate operators. So that's the smallest um, twist in QCD. And so if you want to understand the scaling behavior um, at the LHC, all you need to do is understand these twist two operators in QCD. And so this is something which one can actually find in kind of many textbooks. And so in, in um, QCD, uh, you have essentially, well, you have three twist two operators, but they're characterized by a, something called a spin J and then a transverse spin, which is the kind of real spin about the axis, which can either be zero or two. And so if you look, for example, in Peskin and Schroeder, you'll find that these um, twist two um, operators, which are shown here. And so I'll explain physically how you should think about them in a second. But essentially, there's one for quarks, which has a spin which just di dictates the number of derivatives. There's one for gluons, and then there's one transverse spin two for gluons. And so we'll for now just um, ignore the transverse um, spin two. And so the way you should think about these, so much like the stress tensor, how we kind of moved it off to infinity as a detector, you can take these objects here, and you can also integrate them over time and move them to infinity. And you can imagine there's some kind of theorist detector. And so loosely speaking, what these are doing is detecting either quarks or gluons. And what this J is doing is determining essentially the energy weight that you apply to that. So loosely speaking, if you have so many of these derivatives, if you have higher J's, it's kind of like weighting your with like E squared, E instead of just like a normal calorimeter. And so what we're gonna try and do is essentially if we have multiple of these energy correlators as we operate our product, expand them together, you're gonna to, you're gonna be able to reconstruct them as particular linear combinations of these kind of idealized quark or gluon um, detectors. And so the power is that one only has to understand essentially these two um, objects and one knows their anomalous dimensions. So one knows their kind of twists, which will determine um, the scaling. So I'll give a precise example of this um, just in a second. And so this is just um, to say that, or related to the question earlier, that if you really do this at the LHC, you're not doing this 
in a kind of fully inclusive um, um, way. And so to actually embed this inside, for example, high energy jets, and to take into account like the jet radius and all of this, you actually have to derive kind of a factorization theorem. And I'm not gonna kind of go through the details of this, but just to say that it can be done properly. And so I'll kind of describe it in this idealized way, but whenever I'll show any actual calculation, they'll be done properly embedded in some actual real jet um, at the LHC. Um, so now what one wants to do, and I'll kind of skip over the actual, I can describe to you later what exactly these anomalous dimensions and how you calculate them. <coughs> but if you take, for example, two of these um, energy correlators and bring them together, you move on to what this particular twist to um, spin three anomalous dimensions. So it's just, or twist two spin three operator, which has some uh, well-known anomalous dimension. And so if you kind of now go out and measure the kind of behavior of these correlators as you move them together. So this RL is just the angle between the two um, detectors. So if you measure this, you see that it has some very nice uh, scaling behavior. And so this is purely in this perturbative regime where you can compute in terms of quarks and gluons. And so this is a comparison of actual um, open data from the LHC with our um, perturbative calculation. And so you can see that this exhibits this very nice um, power law scaling behavior as these objects are brought together. And this is really probing a kind of well-known or well-understood anomalous dimension in the field theory. And again, I like to have this analogy with these kind of measurements of, for example, superfluid helium, where here you're really measuring some very complicated collision of the LHC, and you haven't had to do any kind of cleaning of the event or anything. It's just that if you ask the kind of nice question, you get out this kind of beautiful scaling behavior extracted from the asymptotic energy flux. And so you really know exactly what you're measuring in terms of the underlying anomalous dimension, but you've extracted it just from this kind of um, energy flux off of infinity. And so it's very kind of nice because it provides, at least on the theory side, this kind of common language from these kind of critical phenomena to um, jet substructure. Can I ask you, you a said question? This is a, I'm sorry. No, you go ahead. Is this a, you said this is a perturbative calculation. This is the perturbative, this is a perturbative calculation, yes. And uh, in this case, you just took uh, the perturbative means that you just let the, the, the jet, uh, uh, you know, radiate and shower. Uh, so this is actual, so on the, yeah, so this is like real data. So it's full like hadron level yeah, data. Yeah, yeah. Calculation. It's just like in perturbative QCD. So we just computed it in terms of quarks and gluons, um, a different perturbative order. So we've added like no hadronization corrections or anything. It's just like a next leading log perturbative calculation. Um, and so that's why I'll show later what happens, but I've cut off kind of here where you start to have large non-perturbative effects. And I'll come back to that um, in a second. But this is just a pure perturbative correct, uh, calculation with no corrections for hadronization added. And just to show that there's kind of this nice region where it behaves kind of beautifully and you're really just seeing the scaling behavior of quarks and gluons. Um, Looks to me like you have 1.2 million on there. The leftmost point shows some non-perturbative. Yeah, yeah. So one can maybe cut it here. Yes, and I'll, I'll show the full thing um, later where it completely turns over. And so, yeah, I could even cut it maybe a bit lower. This is, yeah. There's a smooth, there's a smooth transition, which is very interesting to understand. Um, uh, but yes, it starts to deviate there, and I'll show in a second it deviates very strongly at slightly below where I cut it off. Yes. Um, okay. And so just to kind of highlight one very nice thing, which one can do with this light ray or this operator product expansion, which is very difficult with standard perturbative approaches, is you can actually um, measure the kind of whole spectrum of all these different anomalous dimensions or the different kind of operators which are determining the structure of the jet. And so one way of imagining this is you can measure higher point correlation functions. So in this, it's illustrated as kind of a three point correlation function. And you can try and understand how this depends on the overall size of the like three point correlation function. And so because of quantum corrections, this will have some scaling and almost dimension as you kind of make the triangle bigger or smaller. And so to remove any classical piece, you can normalize to the two point correlator. And so this object in the classical theory would be completely flat. And so in the quantum theory, these objects, so this generic OJ and this O3 have different kind of anomalous dimensions or different critical exponents. And so now as you change the kind of size of like the three point relative to the two point, you'll see some um, deviation or some scaling behavior as a function of size. And so this is shown here, again, the open data compared to the perturbative calculation for the kind of six point over the two point, the five point, the four point, and the three point. And so each of these is probing, <coughs> excuse me, these different operators here. 
Um, and so each has a different critical exponent. And so by kind of asking these slightly different questions about the energy flux, you're really kind of able to see the spectrum of these different anomalous dimensions, which are controlling the formation of the underlying jets, which again is, is quite pleasing that one has this very sharp um, answer to what exactly you're measuring. Um, and so now one can try and go beyond just the scaling behavior. So I'll just kind of say one more thing about kind of massless um, QCD jets and then start um, adding in some scale. So these kind of scaling behaviors are of course nice, but they're only probing kind of this one anomalous dimension or these kind of particular anomalous dimensions in your theory. And so if you want to kind of start asking more detailed questions, what do you want to probe are like higher point, for example, three point correlation functions. So these now can do more than just change in the function of size, but you can measure the kind of shape dependence or the dependence of this on the shape of that triangle. And so this is something that is commonly done in cosmology. And what we'd like to do a kind of similar thing and measure higher point functions of energy flux. And so I won't go through the kind of details of the calculation, but up here is kind of a formula for what the actual answer looks like um, in some n equals four, but you can do it in QCD as well. And so they have some very nice um, theoretical properties. So you can actually compute how the kind of cross section that you measure depends on the shape of the correlators. And so this becomes a little bit harder to visualize because you now have to, um, you now have kind of multiple parameters. But so what this is shown here is on some open data. So we have fixed the size, the overall size of the triangle, or you can think of like fixing the base, and then you can change the shape of the triangle. So for example, up here is an equilateral triangle. Down here, this parameter is kind of the angle of the um, this side of the triangle. And up here is kind of like a flattened limit where you squeeze it down. So this is just some parameterization. It takes a while to um, get used to it, but it's just the shape or the cross section is a function of the shape of the triangle. And the units don't matter. The units don't matter because I've scaled out an overall size. So now it's just um, for a fixed size. So this would look different at different sizes, but for a fixed size, this is just the, um, these are like dimensionless parameters controlling the shape of the triangle. Um, and this is the like kind of open data. And then on the right is our kind of analytic calculation of this object. And is the, the Q the difference from what you would expect from the two particle, the, the two point? Exactly. So this is like the Q is the like three point normalized to the product of two points. Exactly, exactly. So this is this like kind of non Gaussianity. Um, um, and so this kind of shows that one has, you can actually both kind of measure in quotation marks for the open data and um, compute these higher point correlation functions which are really telling you kind of very detailed features of the energy flux um, within jets. So they're um, kind of describing like multiple splittings um, and how these are correlated, um, which is nice. Okay, so that first part is purely in kind of perturbative QCD. So you just have quarks and gluons and we can use these kind of very nice um, techniques to understand them, and it's in some sense more similar to what these observables were originally um, uh, defined for. And so the kind of surprise, as I said, was that these actually turn out to be a very nice way of identifying, and I hope to argue here, an actual very intuitive way of um, identifying physical scales which exhibit in the problem. Um, so Excuse me, I have a question here on Zoom. Okay. Um, so it's about the previous slide. Yeah. So, um, in the comparison to cosmology, you said yeah. that non Gaussianities can help us understand uh, different models of inflation. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. In the context of QCD, what do we learn about from non Gaussianities? What properties of QCD do we learn? Yeah, so that's a, that's a very good question. So, if one takes QCD as known, then this is just something I, one can compute. And the way I want to kind of view this is kind of like a baseline. So later, what I, what I want to do is to add something additional in. So for the three-point correlator, what I'll do later is add in like a top quark and show how that imprints itself as some kind of very different um, shape. And so you, this is kind of showing that one, in some sense, has control of the base. And then you can add something which modifies, just like how you modify models of inflation, you want to modify by sticking in some additional um, kind of object or some fancier thing, like let's say the QGP or some nucleus in and see how it modifies um, this. So I say this is more just showing in a nice way that we have control over um, perturbative QCD. Thank you, thank you. So you, you will use these uh, non-Gaussianities to understand scales so will, in the second part of the talk. I will 
start in that direction. Okay, so that's the you. kind of, I will hope to convince you that you can start seeing things imprinted in this. I'll show, <clears throat> I'll show an example of the top quark on the three point correlation function. But the kind of broader goal is that in the first part is kind of more like calibrating these objects and showing that we understand them in massless QCD. And then what we want to do is to start sticking in scales and essentially showing how those modify things. And so this is something which is kind of in progress, but I hope to convince you that it's a way of, um, of kind of understanding things. Um, and so very much related, or hopefully this will further kind of address your question. So at the bottom of this slide is kind of the massless um, scaling and the massless non-Gaussianity. But of course, QCD is a kind of much richer theory than just this. And so what one can start to do is to add in different features in QCD. So for example, here one has a kind of a nucleus, a top quark, a bottom quark, hadronization, the quark below plasma. And what I want to show is that each of these imprints itself in some particular way onto the structure of these correlation functions. And so I hope to convince you that this gives a kind of very common way of talking about um, like very different systems all the way from the time scale of kind of top quarks to um, large nuclei and they all imprint themselves in particular characteristic ways onto these correlation functions and then uh, related to your question they will modify this, them in some way which then tells you about that underlying um, system and so that's I'm running a bit um so how much time do I have 10 minutes uh, I right? yeah I think you we started can... late Okay. Yeah, we started a bit late, so I'll try and, yeah. 20 more minutes. Okay, perfect. Okay. You, not, you want another coffee? Uh, <laughs> yeah. I wouldn't mind, but yeah, I can, I'll, I'll wait till after. Okay. Um, so what I'm going to do is to kind of step through a bunch of um, these kind of different systems and essentially to show how when one adds some additional feature beyond just kind of massless QCD, how it imprints itself in a very kind of intuitive way into these um, correlators. So the first thing that one would like to is in some sense the most basic addition because you're not really doing anything um, other than not cutting off the plot on the left hand side is that in QCD it's obviously becomes very non-conformal at some point. Namely, you have some tr transition from weakly coupled quarks and gluons to essentially freely propagating hadrons moving off into your detector. And so what one would like to see is how this is directly imprinted in the correlator. And because the correlator is really isolating the dynamics at some particular um, scale, you expect that you should just see the kind of confinement scale imprinted very cleanly at some particular scale. And so if I just kind of remove the um, barring off of the plot and show the full plot as a function of all angles. So on the right hand side of this is exactly the plot um, which I showed before, where again this um, RL is the distance between or the angular distance between the two correlators. So this very nicely shows the kind of confinement transition between this nice scaling behavior on the um, right hand side of asymptotically free quarks of gluons, and then on the left hand side of essentially free hadrons propagating off into your detector. And so this purple curve um, shown here is really if you just take uniformly distributed kind of balls moving off into your detector with the particular Jacobian I'm plotting with, they have this particular scaling behavior here. And so you can very clearly see the confinement scale imprinted as a kind of characteristic scale um, onto the um, angles of the detector. And so if you map this using the energy that you know of the jets, you get back to the kind of lambda QCD scale. And so related to the kind of question of how you can use the non-Gaussianity. So this, this position of the angle will depend on the energy of the jet. It will depend on the energy of the jet, absolutely. But you can rescale it out and so you can use a rescale variable, which, and then they'll align um, nicely. Um, and so if you're uh, bored, you can go watch this YouTube video here of confinement. So it's a video of the three-point correlator as a function of the overall size. And you can see that as you become, or as you hit this confinement um, transition, it essentially completely washes out the structure of the three-point correlator. And below that, it's just kind of uniform. But at larger angles, you have some nice intricate structure coming from the interactions of the quarks and the gluons. Okay, so the second very simple modification which one can do is to add in like a massive quark. So you can look at um, intrinsic mass effects coming from, um, for example, the B quark mass or the C quark mass inside a jet. And so on the left is just these distributions of this, again, two point correlation function for um, light jets, charm jets, and B quark jets. And so again, you see, so this one is having this nice transition at lambda QCD, as you should have. And for the charm and the B jet, 
what you're again just seeing is that this should happen no longer at lambda QCD, but at the kind of mass scale. So in this case, at the mass of the C quark or at the mass of the B quark. And the, yeah. Just the mass of the initiating being the, the original quark, right? It's not that, I mean, it's only just one quark. Yeah, so yeah. The other still like quark groups. Right? Exactly, exactly, exactly. So this is like a, you should think of this as a jet with kind of one massive B and then it's um, having some quark masses, quarks and gluons around it. And then you can compute the two point correlation function on that. And so then what you see is this kind of quote unquote dead cone. But the nice kind of thing about this is these almost behave like this transition in the confinement case, but it's in a regime where you have perturbative control. And so you can compute exactly the kind of shape of this curve in perturbation theory, at least for the B quark, um, and really kind of see how this B scale is imprinted into the two point correlator. And so this kind of also gives further confidence that you're really understanding how kind of a mass scale is imprinted into the um, angular scale, but in a case where you have kind of um, perturbative control. And so it gives, yeah, more intuition for this um, confinement. Can anybody look at that yet with real data? No. It would be very nice. <laughs> but we can. Some yeah. people start it, but yeah. we don't have enough data. Yeah. So I, I, no plot has been publicly shown. Yeah, you're saying something quite, quite striking. You're saying that the Bitcoin will manifest in 500 GB yet. Yeah. So it's very, so I mean, these are actually very, yeah, exactly. But it's a, so over here, you have this naive massless scaling and you really see this transition and it, it's very cleanly imprinted because you're, and in some sense, this is the, where I think these things become very intuitive is because you're really just looking at one scale at a time. Any other scale clearly imprints itself into these correlators as compared to something like NGNIS. And so that's where I think they're very strong is identifying a single scale um, in the problem. Does CMS have the angular resolution to look at this in 500 GB jets? Do you know? I don't know. I, yes. Can I, can I ask a question? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, Zumbo here. Yeah. It's very nice. Yeah. So I was just wondering, uh, imagine if I have a much smaller uh, JLPT kind of following Peter's uh, like point. Let's yeah, say yeah, my, yeah. my PT of jelly is only something like 50 or, or 20, yeah, 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 25 yeah. GB, which is yeah. more like a consistent, like something from like S Phoenix uh, kinematics. Yeah, 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 yeah. I was just wondering when uh, those number W are uh, like contribution, like, let's say hydronization or other things, my like uh, wash out this nice structure and separation from different gels. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah. a very good question. So I think at 50 GV, so this is something I think that should be studied more. I think at 50 GV, it's okay. And so mostly what that, if you go to 50 GV, and I, I don't know if you can see, but it mostly extends in this right plot. It has this kind of very long scaling regime before it turns over. And so mostly what that, or it kind of shortens the range between this nice perturbative scaling and the actual dead cone kind of region. But I think the, the dead cone scale will still be kind of very clearly imprinted at um, this particular angular resolution. And so that you just won't be able to see the full kind of massless dynamics, but the actual dead cone region, I think for 50 GeV is still very okay. Okay. And that will be very good. Yeah, I guess you can. You guys can even say this uh, uh, in PCR, right? To test yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. Right. So it, yeah, and and yes. So for fifty, I think it's okay. If you go down to like ten or something, it's getting a bit more iffy. Um, right. Okay. Great. Thanks. Yeah. Only one way to find out. Yeah. Yeah. No, and it would be very interesting to to measure, or to see this plot in data would be extremely nice. Um, and in particular, comparing the shape of these or the detailed shape of these for confinement. Because confinement is obviously a more complicated process than just sticking in a mass. And so the fact in some sense that these are so similar is, is very um, surprising, at least to me, where this is like a simple, just adding a perturbative mass and it gives almost the same shape as the full dynamics of confinement. The difference between left and right is uh, one simulation, one perturbative. Or this is just using a different Jacobian kind of zoomed in on this um, particular region. But it's, yeah, this is pure simulation and this is both the simulation and the calculation, but it's, it's mostly just they're plotted in two different ways. Like that. Log and non log. Yeah, surprising or long. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> surprising to me. Yeah, I, I'm not yet worried. I, yeah. Um,
Okay, so now one more kind of high energy one, and I'll keep my pace relatively quick. So another thing one can do, and this is again using the kind of three point correlator, is another kind of scale, which is very hard to access um, or to measure precisely um, at the LHC is the top quark mass. And so it's a very kind of important parameter of the standard model. But one of the things that is a little depressing from the theory perspective is that one of the leading uncertainties on this is that it's actually generically not understood what you're actually measuring. And so this is because what you really need are kind of very simple observables with top mass sensitivity, which you can compute um, in first principles um, theory. And so again, it's this kind of same story that if you have some top quark, even though it lives only for a very kind of short time, it imprints itself into your correlation functions um, at infinity. And so just like the B quark, it has some associated scale and you can measure the kind of three point correlation function. So the top decays primarily into kind of three little subjects. And so this kind of existence of the top fork will imprint itself as a kind of peak at the scale of M squared over Q squared or M squared over PT squared. And so this is just kind of a simulation um, shown here for a fixed kind of equilateral triangle of these correlators for different values of the top mass that you see this kind of imprinted in a very sharp um, peak, um, which depends uh, quite sensitively on the underlying um, top four. And so our hope is that this can actually be used, for example, for a um, top mass extraction at the LHC um, from jet substructure. And again, this kind of motivates further understanding the kind of mathematical structure of these higher point correlation functions. But again, the thing that I think is nice is these are all phrased in the kind of same language as these objects just imprinting themselves in particular structures in the correlation function. And so now in the last five minutes, and I'm sorry I've gone a bit over time, I'll move on to the actual more kind of um, nuclear um, oriented um, applications. And I should say that this is as I start to move uh, further and further from my um, regime of comfort. And so these are things which I um, have very um, excellent collaborators on all of them. And so in particular for this um, QGP, um, I wanna highlight um, Carlotta, um, Andres Pedro Dominguez and Jack Colgan, who really did all the kind of calculations on the um, QGP um, side. And so there's people here that are much more experts on the actual QGP than myself. And so this is just meant to kind of highlight how these energy correlators can be used to think about questions of the QGP and to motivate kind of further questions in that direction. Um, so again, I don't need to say this um, to people here, but one, obviously one thing one would like to understand is kind of how you can extract detailed parameters of the QGP uh, from the asymptotic energy flux. And so again, from a very simplistic uh, theorist perspective, essentially what one is doing is just kind of shooting a quark or gluon through some little blob of um, QGP, and this is imprinting itself into the energy flux in infinity. And so again, the kind of nice thing about these correlators is because you can tune the scale, you believe that this is sensitive to dynamics at a particular scale inside the QGP. So if I have some dynamics at some scale in the QGP, it will imprint itself at a particular angular scale within these correlators, just like for these B mass or C mass or top quark mass. And so here one can do the absolute simplest thing is to just see if you could detect the scale of the QGP. So you can have something where you fix the size of the QGP and then kind of shoot something through it. And then now what you want to do is to measure the two point correlator as a function of the angle. And so the way one should think about this is if you have a very, something with a very, very small opening angle, it means the kind of intermediate parton live for a very, very long time before splitting. And so as you increase this angle theta, you're here between, or in the correlator, you're essentially driving things back um, in kind of time or length scale to things which split earlier and earlier. And so this is very much in the same way as how you're able to detect the confinement or the B and um, C mass. And so what you expect is that as you increase theta, this should look essentially kind of like the vacuum. And then at some point you should detect an abrupt, at least if you have kind of a fixed size plasma that you're shooting things through, you should detect a kind of abrupt transition at a particular angular scale corresponding to the size of the um, object. And so this is just a kind of calculation of this um, shown over here, where you see this kind of nice vacuum scaling up here at very small angles. And then exactly this scale, almost exactly like in the hadronization case, you see abruptly the kind of um, presence of a sharp transition where you enter um, the plasma. And so this is kind of exactly the analog of confinement before a larger, say, I don't know, if you convert this um, using PT to say like a 10 Fermi object, you can detect it in exactly the same way 
as this sharp transition. And so this kind of shows that you can identify exactly the scale of the plasma. And then what we'd like to do is to kind of measure um, more sophisticated correlators in that regime now that you've isolated um, that dynamic. And so just as a kind of, um, to convince you that this is not just kind of a story, so the thing that should be a kind of very sharp um, and robust prediction is that you have a transition at this particular scale, because that's essentially just kind of dimensional analysis and showing there's a mapping between the scales of the underlying QGP and the angular scales of this correlator. And then the actual detailed behavior at this um, transition is what will be sensitive to the parameters of the underlying model. And then you can use this to try and understand um, those parameters. And so this is just showing some um, calculations in a bunch of different um, models um, shown here. And so the point is that these all transition in almost exactly or at the same angular point, which is just saying that this is a kind of physical scale um, imprinted into these correlators. And then the different models all give different um, parameters, for example, for the scaling after or for the kind of size. But it's the, the kind of robust prediction is that you have a kind of scale imprinted, and then you'd like to extract parameters by studying more detail um, the kind of transition uh, point shown here. And similarly, by looking at the actual structure of the transition, so for example, if you look at the, in these um, distributions, you can kind of take a ratio of the angle at which the kind of peak turns over up here to where the kind of uh, modification starts. And if you do this, you can start to see kind of two distinct behaviors, which kind of see if there's kind of coherence um, in the problem. And so ideally, there's kind of many more things one wants to do um, in the setup is to really understand kind of the structure and shape of the correlation function in this transition region. And so this is kind of a very preliminary just to show that you can um, detect the scales um, shown here. And then finally, and I apologize, I'm mostly running over time, um, but the final application is to kind of use this same trick to image um, cold nuclear matter. And so this, this is mostly with people um, all here. And you can see the paper was nicely um, posted I got the number one spot yesterday um, by Kyle. <laughs> and so this is um, Kyle and Wen Ching are much more um, experts on this. But I'll just again show how one can use the same philosophy um, to detect the underlying presence of a uh, kind of nuclei. Um, and so again, I don't need to justify this particular aspect to uh, people here. But so the electron ion collider will provide kind of very nice high energy collisions on a huge variety of nuclei. And so the thing that's kind of fun uh, for this for the energy correlators is you can just change the size of the underlying nuclei and they should all imprint themselves as a very clear characteristic scale in the um, energy correlators. And so the thing I like about this is you can kind of phrase in the same size these questions all the way from the scale of the kind of top quark all the way up to the kind of 10 Fermi as imprinting themselves in the asymptotic energy flux. And so the way one views this is very analogous to the case of this QGP where you want to view it as a function of the angle between the two correlators and as you increase the size of the angle, you drive it back inside the nucleus. And so you're sensitive to the nuclear uh, modification. And so over here is just a plot again of this angular correlator or this two point correlator as a function of the angle. And you can see in this um, color down here is the EP. And then as you go to, for example, gold uh, for different nuclear modifications, you can see that at large angles, you have a large um, modification as you start going inside um, the nucleus. So K is something parameterizing. It's in a particular thing in E high thing. It's just the, essentially the strength of the interaction. Um, yeah, it's related to Q hat. Yeah. Um, and so one thing which is kind of neat, which one can do at the ESC because it's very clean, but which you cannot do at um, LHC as much, is you can actually tune the weighting of this energy. So instead of just doing energy correlators, you can do kind of E to the N correlators. And so here you can actually go below um, one. So these are, this is a ratio of the gold or a difference of the gold to um, proton for these E N correlators. And you can see that for smaller values of N, which are kind of enhancing soft radiation, you get larger um, medium modifications. Whereas for larger values of N, which are going more and more to collinear particles, you get less and less modification. And so this is kind of how one images essentially um, energy dependence through these correlators is by using um, different powers or different weightings of the energy. And so it's kind of like a, in some sense, a Fourier transform or a Mellon transform or Laplace transform of um, fragmentation. And so again, the very nice thing is that at the ESC, you can kind of change the size of the nucleus 
And so you should be able to see that this different nuclear sizes are all imprinted into different characteristic scales uh, within the correlator. And so you can, on the left, you can see this for different values of, um, these are all the different nuclei shown here. And then again, as you go back, so if you start at very small angles and slowly drive your correlator to larger and larger angles, you should hit bigger nucleus first. And so as you, and you see that you clearly hit like uranium and gold, and so you see these first, and then you slowly see as you drive more and more and more in, smaller and smaller nuclei at larger and larger angles because you need to push them back. And so if you rescale by the kind of um, size, then you see that these all kind of very nicely align and you can actually just extract the kind of size dependence of the underlying nucleus. Um, and so you can see the degrees kind of very nicely um, up here. And so this is kind of really neat. So you can actually see the underlying nuclear size of the kind of femtometer scale um, imprinted into the um, asymptotic energy flux. And so this provides kind of a common language uh, from hot to cold QCD of talking about um, the asymptotic energy flux in jet substructure. And so just to summarize, and I apologize again for going over time. So I hope to have convinced you that some of these nice insights from formal theory are transforming the way we think about jet substructure. And so this originally came into the very high energy jets where you can use this kind of nearly conformal um, language to talk about the interactions of quarks and gluons. And this original link was because when it's studying this very small angle limit, where you can really use this operator product um, expansion to relate um, the behavior in jet substructure with um, asymptotic um, scaling behavior. And so this gave a kind of very nice bridge between field theory developments um, and QCD phenomenology. And so then more recently, this has kind of shifted to sticking in different scales, which is something which is um, kind of ideal for nuclear physics, and seeing how these kind of intrinsic and emergent scales um, imprint themselves into the correlators at very um, characteristic scales. And so this gives a kind of very nice way of talking about asymptotic energy flux in a kind of unified um, framework. Um, and hopefully there'll be many more applications to come. So thank you. That last calculation that, uh, that you guys did is very interesting, actually. You saw it last night, so it's primed for it. Um, there was a, so this is, this is sort of energy loss interactions in the, in the cold QCD. It's a recent paper by uh, Xiaowei Liu and Fang and company. Yeah, yeah. Um, actually looking at kind of initial state, color glass content. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, first of all, is that related? And then the second question, so we're proposing a very forward calorimeter for Alice out to eta 5.5, the full calorie. You may have heard about it from your Alice, Alice, Alice collaborators at uh, Yale. Um, and um, we are talking to them also about looking at energy, energy correlators in very forward direction in yeah. PA at the LAC. So first question, can you extend your calculation to very forward at the LHC. And second of all, is there a connection between your calculation yeah. and the CGC calculation? Absolutely. So, so Wa Jing is also on that, and he's been a collaborator of mine on many of these energy correlators. And so it's coming from the exact same philosophy of trying, so in that case, it's the saturation scale, right? But you're trying to identify some emergent scales that break in the scaling behavior. So philosophically, it's identical to all the cases um, presented here. And I think it's a very nice application of it. It's slightly different technically in how you're extracting that from the correlator. So this is really always two being brought together. As you said, that's more bringing it. Um, so there's like a nucleon energy correlator. So it's technically slightly different, which is why it probes the uh, initial state effects. So these are essentially independent of the initial state effects because you're looking at the small angle or universal limit, whereas that's taking a very different limit where it's sensitive almost purely to the initial state effects, but it's philosophically identical that any like emergence there and saturation is like an emergent scale of QCD should imprint itself very nicely into the correlator. Right, that right the continuum between kind of looking at initial state and looking at final state. It's the way you describe it, it sounds like that. Yeah, so there's a there's a continuum between the two, and the the but in the middle it's very hard to make any general statements. And so it's kind of the two extreme limits where you get nice kind of quote unquote universal behavior. Um, and so this is the same, even if you go to the simpler case of like E plus E minus, you can take the correlators either very close together or very far apart. And in both cases, you have some limiting nice uh, behavior, which is probing something about the underlying field theory. Um, but they're, and they're both sensitive to the scales that are emerging, um, but they're just like 
technically they're a little bit different, but philosophically, I would say they're absolutely the same. It's, it's a very nice application. Um, what about very forward to the LHC? Very forward to the LHC uh, for two point correlation functions. Um, I think it's, I would need, it's very, I, I don't have anything intelligent to say, but I think. calculation on your feet? No, I cannot, I cannot. Um, it's, it's interesting to, yeah, and particularly if calorimeters are being built very forward, it's definitely interesting. Um, I mean, um, what would you do? Just change the X range you flow, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. But it's, it's. Well, uh, the color flow is different. I mean, it's, it's a, it's a, I mean, you, you can, you can, there are factorization theorems. You can, you can, yeah, yeah. factorize. Yeah. Processes. So the yeah. Digest with your know, bounce digest is one. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Um, direct photon production. I mean, there are. Yeah, there yeah. are uh, there are clean processes you can think about. Yeah, no, I think it's 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 very interesting. I it's not something I've thought very much about, but it, it is it is extremely interesting. Or personally, as you can tell, I like phrasing things in this language. Yeah. And so I think things about forward physics phrasing this in this language the energy correlate is a very interesting thing to do. Um, Yeah. Back on slide like 36, when you were talking about the transition to the quark muon plasma. Yeah, yeah. When you, or, no, yeah. That transition, do you yeah. mean from when you're going from a quark muon plasma, plasma to a non? Uh, no, good. So here, one can, and where these calculations are done is I can take, like, a, let's say, just like imagine I have like a block of QGP. So this is not something that can be done experimentally, but just imagine that I have a perfectly stationary block with, I think this was done for like 10 femtometers or something. And then I shoot something through it. Um, and so then the, if in this first case, as this, so I'm, imagine it's being kind of produced in the middle and then it's coming out. And so if it kind of shoots, um, if it kind of goes out, then in this case, if it goes all the way out to your detector, like well outside the plasma before it's splitting, it should not really be modified, but when the details of this splitting are gonna be modified by the plasma. And then the, the nice thing is because you have this angular scale, you can kind of control where the splitting occurred. So you kind of have like a parameter or like a scale. And that's the reason why it's nice probing scales is because you essentially have some scale to compare to. I can't read the red. So yeah, sorry. when so, the splitting is earlier, does that come at larger log? Good. Yeah. So the way you should think about it is the lifetime of this particle. And sorry, it's yeah, it goes like one over the angle squared. So if the angle is very small, it means it propagated very far and then just split. And so then as you increase the angle of the theta, you're shortening the lifetime of the intermediate particle and kind of driving it back into the plasma. Um, and so this is what I mean is whether you see the plasma or not, essentially if it's splitting or it's kind of, you should think about it, is the like size of this plasma at the same size as the angle or is it bigger or smaller? And so if it's if the angle is much smaller, it's very small, you just don't see the plasmas there. So it's like you can kind of expand in like one over um, that thing. And then once they're comparable, you see something abrupt happen. And then over here, you go into some, again, some scaling regime where the splitting is like deep inside the plasma. So that just means the plasma looks like infinitely big to you. Um, and then there's like this kind of region here where you're like right at the, you're sensitive to kind of the size of the plasma. You're like right at the size. And so, in all these things, what you're kind of doing is comparing the angular scale to whatever scale, like pop quark mass, B quark, you're always just comparing like some scale to the angular scale. And then you just kind of sweep the angular scale and you see something at some particular size. Okay, so in slide, in slide 32, this is related to what you just said. So yeah. for, for the top quark mass, so Ian, what if I have uh, in the proton a scalar di quark at a specific mass, 500, 540 MeV, and a vector di quark sitting at about 800 MeV? Could, could, and of course, they're going to be whatever you see in the detector is going to be correlated because they came from the same type of parent. Yes. Could, could you find those guys using the same m, m squared over q squared? Maybe. So, for the, if, yeah, that's a good, so they, they would modify in some sense the like hadronization, presumably. Yeah. And so I think in this, like, I think so something which is measuring in detail the structure of this um, hadronization peak here is something which is very interesting. So people are, are doing it. Um, and there, presumably, if you have some different model for um, what's going on inside the proton, that should imprint itself at this scale here and kind of how they combine. Because I think it's hard. That's my guess for where it would kind of appear. At the um, hadronization scale. At the hadronization, or kind of as, because this is kind of sensitive or in this 
let's say like maybe in this like B fork. So here you're kind of seeing like the scale or how kind of these things kind of form together into the hadron. And so if you change the model of hadronization, you will change the shape of this green peak here. Um, yeah, but I don't think I'm changing the, the model of hadronization. I'm just saying what you started with, the hadronization starts, I mean, it begins at the same place. Yeah. But what you started with is something different. It's not, it's two quarks that were bound together in a bi quark. Okay. And so we're going to have some kind of relation. I don't think they should change I, the where hadronization okay. starts. Okay, good, good. So they may not, let's say I don't change where hadronization starts, yeah. but I expect that I would change the shape of this peak in that region. Uh, okay. Would be my, and that's, this is related to your question about whether it's surprising or not surprising, or that the if I just compute this with like a perturbative B quark as a mass, that it's so similar in shape to the hadronization. And my guess is that in the real world, that's probably not exactly true. If you measure higher point correlation functions, you should somehow be able to disentangle that. Um, but my guess is that like if you say something different is inside the or like dichord, this will it has to change something about the hadronization process. And so one wants to measure some form of two point or higher point correlation functions and measure the detailed shape in the region where they're kind of combining together into the proton would be my, um, but I think what this exact shape means is kind of, yeah, not so well explored, um, but yeah, it's a good question. Yeah. The question on online. Online. So do you want to unmute and ask? I think Bert, do you have a hands up? Do you want to just unmute and ask? Yes. Yeah, hello, um, Ian. Thanks. Very, very interesting um, and clear talk. Thank you. I have two very simple questions. Sure. Um, maybe. The first one is about the vacuum um, energy correlator. Yeah. And um, it's clear that there is a scale at which the um, perturbative region makes a transition over into the hadronic region. Yeah. We call that is associated with the confinement scale. Yes. But it has really two scales. One is the location of, let's say, the maximum, or however you want to define it. And the other one is the width. Yeah. Do we understand what they tell us about confinement or the confinement mechanism that is beyond just the confinement scale? Because there are two scales in that, in a sense. Yeah. So yeah, the short answer is no, but I would love to know. And I think this is why it's worth exploring um, in more detail. And I think even having like toy calculations, that even in some very simple hadronization model with some kind of string tension and asking how those parameters, like the string tension or something map onto the parameters of this peak. Like they have to do it in some way. Um, and I think this would be extremely interesting to understand. Um, but the short answer is, yeah. I, I do not understand. Oh. Okay, the other question is about um, the data in relation to theory. Yeah. Um, and, and fundamentally, what you showed are energy correlator that are based on calorimetric measurements. But many detectors instead look at charged particle tracks. Is there anything yes. in addition to energy, pure energy correlator that we know, that we learn from the charged energy correlators? I personally think yes, um, because they're telling you something more differential about the hadronization um, transition. So I think the detailed shape of this transition on charged, or you can do like plus minus correlators, there's a bunch of combinations you can do. And I don't, there's no reason to believe, or I have no reason to believe that if you do this or measure the detailed structure of this transition on charged particles, that it should be exactly the same as on neutral particles. Um, and so it's telling you something and one understands in theory how to map a kind of charged detector. There's kind of a non perturbative matching coefficient called the track function, which you can map between. And so it's probing some kind of how, or in the confinement process, how quarks and gluons go to charge particles of different types. And so it's some more differential information, um, which I think is, is very interesting to yeah, understand. I think a lot of these one has to understand a bit better precisely what this curve is telling you, but it's definitely telling you something. Um, and so I think more thought um, should go into it, but I think it's, it's providing a very clear way of imaging the confinement transition, which should be explored more. Yeah, okay, I wish thank I had you. Better, I wish I had better answers, but that's, yeah. <laughs>
No, 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 no. I mean, that's 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 good enough. Thank you. He's telling you, forty-two. <laughs> exactly. And so she can you answer. Yeah, um, well, we, we, we can finish. I can talk to you later. Sure, sure. Yeah. Awesome. yeah this is regarding the colonization, actually. Oh, okay, okay. So anyway, if you go, I mean, if you look at the, I mean, you know that the, the very small angle. Finally, the the homologation has to keep in. Right. Yes, yeah, yeah. And if you go back to your calculation with heavy ions, you know, this, uh, you yeah. see there is a scaling. Good, good. Okay, yeah. Yeah, good. so, so it's essentially, at a small angle, the uh, harmonization comes in. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. And the, the harmonization mechanism yeah. in vacuum is different. As, yeah, this is sense. absolutely, this is very interesting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. In fact, that's what I'm talking about. We actually trying to we see that. Uh, Beautiful. In, in okay, yeah. So I want to talk to you. Yes. So you will be able, so eventually you will be able to see yeah. the difference. So the, the, the vacuum one was the heavy ion one at the small angle, yeah. they will diverge. Yeah, no, that, that's beautiful. Yes, I would yeah. I will be very glad to talk. Yeah. So this is this this calculation here as you, or as you know is just a perturbative, so that's why it just yeah, keeps you, going you, off. You, yeah. You, you, you don't have exactly. Any yeah, exactly. So we were just focused on this region, but yeah. That's if that's absolutely beautiful. Yeah. I yeah. would love to see your plot. Yeah. <laughs> So, you know, that, that's very nice, yeah. Great. So, any more questions from online person? I think we had a very nice and long discussion already. Okay, now I'll say thank you again. And, uh, thank you.